Hello, and welcome to Zoomed In with Alexis. I'm your host, Alexis. Today, my guest is Peter Brogius, Artistic Director of the Tony Award-winning Children's Theatre Company of Minneapolis. Peter has served as Artistic Director of Children's Theatre Company, or CTC, since 1997, directing the world premieres of Dr. Seuss's The Snitches, The Musical, The Last Firefly, Seed Folks, Animal Dance, and many others, producing more than 187 productions just with the CTC. He is the recipient of a number of awards, including TCG's Alan Schneider Director's Award and honors from the LA Drama Critics Circle Award and Drama Log. Peter was, Peter's work returns to the stage with Alice in Wonderland, playing February 13th through March 31st of this year. Peter, thank you so much for being here with me today. It's a pleasure, Alexis. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So I'm interested to get into the work that you've been doing for almost 30 years now with the Children's Theater, but I'm curious to hear if you yourself were a child of the theater. Yes, I was very fortunate in that uh, my mother uh, was an amateur actress. And so it was very common for two or three of us kids to be in a show at the same time or to be in a show with her. And so we'd slam down some dinner, rush off to rehearsal, maybe one rehearsal, maybe several rehearsals. And it was from her that I sort of uh, fell in love with the theater and fell in love with the idea of this community of people coming together to make something beautiful, you know? Awesome, awesome. So as a, I'm actually a fellow Hampshire alum as well. Yay! Um, so I'm also very curious to hear how you heard about Hampshire College. Okay, I mean, the long and short of it was, let me think. I was, I'd been going to Berkeley and I had planned to be a lawyer and that had stopped making sense. So I sort of dropped out and uh, moved to Europe for a year and worked on kibbutzim and farms in Denmark and, and, and tried to get work on fishing boats in Norway and did all that. And while there, I said, well, I should probably get a bit of an education. <laughs> and so I, I came back to the East Coast and I, uh, I, think, I think a person I met in Greece had mentioned Hampshire. And so I came back to the East Coast and things were a little different then. So I hitchhiked all over the East Coast and looked at about five different colleges, Hampshire being one of them. And um, and I think, I think I kind of fell in love with it because it felt like it was gonna be the most challenging of all the schools that I saw. I said, this is gonna be, this may be the hardest. And so I decided to apply and got in and uh, had a, a really important uh, two and a half years. You know, I didn't do four because I did a little bit of Berkeley before then. So it was a, a remarkable experience in so many ways. Wow. You know, wow. So, because, oh, sorry. Yeah. Can I ask what, what was your graduating year? Uh, 75. Awesome. So what kind of, what was like the landscape at Hampshire at that time? Well, what was amazing is there were people who had accepted to go there when there was not a building built. Okay. So they, they said, yeah, I'd like to come there because, you know, it started in 70. And so, you know, they, they'd come aboard. I, I got there in the uh, winter of 72, you know. And so you look at these people, you go like, you're some brave folks, you know. You accepted this promise that, A, they would build a building or two and there would be a program and there would be some faculty and all that. And so there were some great people. Um, what was great about it was the promise of real interdisciplinary, real collaborative work, real meetings with your professors, real befriending your professors. All that was true. You know, it was just terrific. Mm. And, uh, you know, back then, uh, like I was doing a lot of dance and the dance studio was on the fourth floor of the library. And the library, the dance studio had no walls. It had a curtain around it. And on the outside of the curtain, were all the, the sculpture and painting studios. So, wow. you know, you'd be working on a piece till 11 o'clock at night, and then you go sit and watch one of your classmates, one of your friends, making a sculpture, making a painting, and then you'd incorporate that into your piece. And so there were, there were things about that that were just lovely. Wow. And an important thing that Hampshire had that was so brilliant was they received some money from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, and you could apply for it as a student, and there was a little pot of money. And so, uh, I was able to get several of those pots. And uh, one, I thought maybe I'd be a, a movement therapist. So I went to a conference, I believe in Indiana, Indianapolis, and you know, spent a weekend with in the, immersing myself in that world. And then when I was gonna do my Div 3, I, I decided I wanted to teach a course um, instead of writing a paper. So I 
and then being, you know, a, a little bit of an overachiever, I decided not only to teach a course, but have a lecture series and a film series and a course that I taught. Wow. Um, and so, so I got money from Hampshire and the Rockefeller Brothers Fund to go research. It was on political theater. And then, and then a lecture series involving a whole bunch of people from New York and scholars and uh, activists and um, artists to come up and give talks and show their films and then lectures and films and all that. And, you know, I got to spend a summer in New York spending immersing myself at the Lincoln Center Library for the Performing Arts, researching the history of political theater, both in the United States and in Europe and all over the world and came back and used all that to teach my class. So it was, uh, you know, it, it, it taught you to like seize opportunities and make your own work, which was not a bad thing if you plan to have a career in the arts. Yeah, yeah. And so I guess if there, you you gave a lot um, speaking to this, but I guess, was there anything else about your experience at Hampshire that you feel like you draw from in your work now or, or that stuck with you? Um, one is, I mean, Hampshire is hugely entrepreneurial. You know, that you, you can make it, you can create relationships, that it doesn't have to be the, you know, sort of this prepackaged thing. You can imagine your own world, you know, as I was, you know, creating, you know, programs in both dance and political theater, you know, as one thing, you know, those that's not like the norm in most in most colleges. And so um, so I got to take classes in dance, both at Hampshire and at Smith and, you know, create lots of pieces, work in the electronic music studio and then I guess the things that really stuck with me were the personal relationships I made with faculty, mm. you know, that, you know, you're invited into someone's house, you're hanging out with them. And one of those experiences, uh, there was a professor, Andy Robinbach, who was a scholar of, you know, German politics, German political theory, you know, uh, German critical thinking. And he had a friend named Jack Zipes, uh, who was also one of his co-editors on a, uh, on a leftist journal called New German Critique. And uh, so, and Andy invited me over to his house or his apartment or somehow I met Jack. I don't really remember. And we hit it off. And Jack was busy translating uh, work from perhaps the most important theater for young people in the world, a company in Berlin called the Grips Theater. And uh, so he opened my mind to this company that was making work about the real lives of young people, mm -hmm. you know, politically engaged work, work that really spoke to the concerns a lot around class a lot around class and uh and out of that came a fascination with it so then i hopped an icelandic air flight for a hundred dollars and went to went to berlin and showed up at their doorstep and said hello and then just hung out with them for months and traveled with them and saw every show and and just happened to be in germany at a time when it was the epicenter of the world in terms of new theater for young people that was radical innovative surprising controversial and uh, uh, and that was all because of Jack. Jack handed me plays to translate, or handed me plays that he translated. I produced one down in in Holyoke, wow. you know, uh, at a community center, uh, uh, and uh, and that just got me really interested in this field. And then I saw artists in Germany because of Jack encouraged Jack's encouragement to. Um, I just saw artists who were making work that was passionate and smart and clear and profound and um, getting them in trouble with the authorities. So it was really exciting. <laughs> wow, that's that's really awesome. And, and so uh, thank you for sort of giving us an insight into how you are sort of entering this realm of children's theater. But I right. guess I'm, I'm very curious to hear what unique like sort of wins and challenges do you face in, in that realm of ch children's theater in the production end? Um, well, I work at a very large theater now. So I work at an extraordinary theater, you know, with a $13 million budget, a full-time staff of about 83 different theaters, you know, scene shop, prop shop, costume shop, wig shop, you know. So I'm very blessed. You know, I work at a major, major, major institution that gets, you know, major press coverage, major funding. So um, I face the challenges of anyone who runs a theater at this point in our time, which is that it's hard. You know, you know, with with corporate funding drying up and, you know, audience behavior being complicated, you know, it's just a it's a very interesting time to run a theater, you know, be, 
costs go up, union costs go up, we're a union house, and yet there's no great new sources of money. And so it's a challenge. The, some of the specific challenges that I faced over the years, and I've been doing this a long time now because I, I, I've been at CTC for 27 years. Before that, I ran a theater in, in Honolulu mm -hmm. for about two years. And before that, I was at the Mark Taper Forum running a program at the Mark Taper Forum for about 10 years um, and on the artistic staff there. When I started, um, there were very few foundations that would support theater for young people, very few. Mm -hmm. And so I made it kind of a personal mission to say, that is offensive, you know, you know, insane and uh, un absolutely unacceptable. So I, I wrote letters and contacted every foundation that was saying they had in their bylaws, we don't support theater for young people. And just said, how can you disenfranchise an entire population of people, mm. the most poor, the most abused, those without voting rights, mm. those without income? How are you going to disenfranchise that group of serious professional artists who have dedicated their lives to making this work? And, you know, one by one, there's like one foundation that I haven't won yet. And it irks me. I won't mention them on this, but, you know, I've tried. I've, I've done so much to try and get those that the prohibitions out of their bylaws. But 99 percent of the other foundations now have no restrictions. Mm. And so it was a tougher time. There were places, you know, getting press coverage was tougher. That's changed. You know, it's changed. Not in all communities. There's still challenges. Uh, but, you know, my situation is sort of blessed. I work with, you know, leading designers, leading actors, leading directors, both in the United States and in Europe and around the world. So um, I can't complain because you know, I get to work with really remarkable artists who care deeply about the work that's... and deeply about making extraordinary work. So Yeah, that's all you can really hope for, right? That's Oh, my that's God, amazing. yes. Oh, my God, yes, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and also, the other thing that's interesting about this is it does ask a slightly different thing. It asks the same things in terms of making extraordinary design, great dramaturgy, you know, beautiful writing, you know, incredible work with the actors. All those are the same. But it also asks something else. Because sometimes in theater, you're making work for yourself. You know, you're making work that just matters really deeply personally to you and maybe two of your friends, you know. But, and with this, it also asks you to have a generosity of spirit mm. because not only do you have to make work that's going to make you proud, but you have to make work that's going to truly engage and truly speak to an audience that is different than you, mm. that is younger than you, mm. that is no less smart than you, but you have to respect them. Mm. You have to come at it with great respect. You have to come at it in a way with love because you want to bring them along. You want to give them a transformational experience. You want to give them something that is going to impact their lives forever because if you do it well you will you will make them love this art form which is a great art form the theater if you do it poorly and shoddily and with condescension or laziness you will turn them off to this work for the rest of their lives because they'll be bored mm. they have so many other options lordy lordy lord mm. they've got a universe in their iphone you know yeah. they've got more tiktok videos than you can watch until you die yeah you know and then on at home, 47,000 streaming channels. So right. you've got to make something that's alive and vital with high stakes and clarity and a purpose. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So so you've produced, you know, children's theater pieces ranging from, you know, the well-known A Year with Frog and Toad to lesser known titles. What do you look for in a piece then, especially when you're hoping to, you know, reach these folks um, when you're deciding on what to produce? So... There's actually two questions being asked there maybe. One is uh, how do you plan a season sure. of work? And the other is what's the work you commission mm. to develop from scratch? And um, is that a fair sure, estimation? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, and so let's start with the work we commission, all right? With the work we commission, we almost always start with the artist. It's a love affair, you know? I see your work, I read your work, I love it. I want you to make something for this audience. Previous experience with this audience is not required. I'd say 95% of the people we commission have never made work for a multi-generational audience. Mm. They're just good theater makers. Mm. And so, and so, and what's that mean? It means someone who has an original voice, who, you know, makes smart, bold, deep, complicated, rich, highly theatrical work. And, and that process is everything from, uh, hi, what interests you? Tell me about yourself. We try and find, and it may be that they have wonderful ideas. It may be they have no ideas. They may say, 
Are there things you'd like me to think about? Are there books? Are there films? Are there songs? Are there poems? Are there issues? And so I may make lists knowing something about their work of here are five books. Here are some things happening in our community we might want to make something about, you know, and we talk. And in my case, I, I, I don't, I don't just hand out a commission like a candy. I, I want to commission something I'm going to produce because I don't do this to fill a box in a grant application. I commissioned X number of people that I don't care about that. What I care about is getting work that's going to go on our stage. That's going to change lives. Mm. So in that case, what that means is I have to fall in love with your idea and, and you may have one idea, and I don't fall in love with it, and that may end our relationship. Or we may have a long conversation that may take months mm. as we try and find something that you're truly passionate about, I'm passionate about, and that I want the theater to do mm. because it's going to take time, it's going to take effort, it's going to take soul and heart and brain and money. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to invest a lot, and it may take years, you know, multiple readings, multiple workshops, mm. many conversations about the dramaturgy. Mm. Um, and so I want, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Life is short. I don't want to do that unless it's something I love mm -hmm. and I believe will make a difference. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's the commissioning side. And then we move heaven and earth. We find partners, we find money. You say, you know, you want to take a trip to so-and-so to do research. We try and find the money. You say, you just need to sit in a rehearsal room away from your family or your job or whatever it is and just write. So we'll provide you with snacks and coffee and close the doors or open them and take you out to dinner and do that. Or you say, I need to hear it with the actors. So we'll do that. Or I need a workshop. I need a choreographer. I need a great dramaturg. So we try within the limits of our possibility to, uh, to find everything that you need so that you can make the best work you want to do. And then we produce it mm. and we produce it fully with, you know, ideally with teams that you're excited about, that you love, and with some remarkable actors and great designers and and uh, and and a great, I mean, the team here is amazing in terms of our shops and, you know, and our marketing and all that. So there's that. With a season, it's a little tricky. There's a whole set of things that we take into consideration. We are committed to 50% of our actors being BIPOC. Mm -hmm. We're committed to 50% of our work being from BIPOC perspectives. Mm -hmm. We have an acting company. Mm -hmm. So how do we give them work You know that, that keeps them alive? We're one of the few theaters in the United States that has a full-time acting company. We have uh, apprentices, acting apprentices, who we audition from across the country to a year, who we give you know a, a, a salary in healthcare and then real roles. Do we have real opportunities for them? Are we making work for a multitude of ages? Is there a multitude of aesthetics? Because the theater is a big tent. Um, and can we make rent? <laughs> you know, <laughs> will, it, will, will the mix of things that we're looking at sell enough that it will keep the building open? And are we creating work that responds to this moment and that provides opportunities for conversation, that stirs it up, that helps us think? that uh, raises real questions, that gives the community a place to come together. Because as much as social media does that in one way, there's something sort of safe and distant about posting on social media that's completely different than being in a room and having conversation and having that conversation in a multi-generational space. So that nine-year-old is saying something profound to that 35-year-old, to that 72-year-old, and you're all in conversation together about X or Y. And so, so um, that panoply of concerns that, that deal with, and are we bringing new work to the stage that comes out of uh, uh, work that we've commissioned? And, and we also look around the world at work that we can present. You know, we brought in circuses from Ethiopia. You know, I'm in conversation with a circus right now from South Africa. Mm. You know, like, how do you bring in work that speaks to other cultures, other communities, you know, mm. and opens doors because if we know anything, I mean, you know, uh, it's that the world is getting smaller. The world is, we need to know how to talk to people who are different than we are, you know, and we need how to find ways to come together and learn from each other because otherwise this planet is in deep trouble. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that you, 
you've elaborated on this a lot, but but I'm wondering if there's anything else that you can think of. So so under your leadership, the CTC received the 2003 Regional Tony Award, which congratulations. Thank you. Um, that was very nice. How, how does a person accomplish this? Um, I think... You know, that's for a sustained body of work. And I think what it was was a, a glorious recognition of the work that this team and this theater has done over the years, you know. And by that, I mean supporting artists to the best that we possibly can, mm. creating work that was, you know, strikingly original and highly theatrical. And, you know, and whether that was work that was as as mad as imagining a lost Buster Keaton film and doing a sort of a silent film on stage with a cast of 60, you know, wow. to uh, hiring one of the great postmodern dancers in the United States today, Ann Carlson, and commissioning her to create a piece of her doing improvisational dance with untrained live baby animals, you know, like that, you know? <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and you know, we developed it over many, many workshops or bringing in Monique Merricks, one of the best directors in Holland to create a deconstructed look at fairy tales with an incredible design team from from the Netherlands, wow. you know, um, uh, or doing, uh, you know, I'm from California originally. And when I got here, one of the things that was I just couldn't get was the Mississippi River. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Uh, uh, and so I decided I have to investigate it and make a piece about it because I look at it, you know, when you go to the Pacific Ocean, there's a power, you know, and like those sh that water started in Russia or China or Japan mm -hmm. or Korea or Okinawa. And and so so I said, let's do a piece about the uh, um, the uh, uh, the Mississippi. And we found an artist who'd made a three mile long canvas of the Mississippi and created an art form called the the panorama, which was like an early slideshow, you know, and so. And he would tour this around. They built panorama theaters in England. They were all over the United States. And so we made a piece about the, this young artist, John Van Vard, and about the Mississippi and the myths of the Mississippi and the power of the Mississippi and the spirit of the Mississippi. And we made a beautiful piece called Mississippi Panorama, you know, which ended with Take Me to the River, mm -hmm. you know, with the talking heads and, you know, uh, uh, Al Green, you know, singing Take Me to the River, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so... Uh, so we also do things like that, you know, like how do you investigate the times you live in? And, yeah. And for example, we knew, I mean, you know, we've had, you know, some significant uh, uh, challenges and, you know, uh, uh, occurrences in this community of violent interactions between the police force and African-American men. And so with the murder of George Floyd, we just knew we had to do something to bring this community together. And so we commissioned right away a playwright we'd worked with multiple times, a book by three child psychologists in Atlanta called Something Happened in Our Town, which was about a, a police involved killing of a, of a black man in an unnamed town. And the the challenges it posed to a friendship between a black girl, a black boy and a white girl who are neighbors mm -hmm. and their families. Mm -hmm. And so we commissioned Cheryl West, who's an extraordinary playwright. She wrote it and we put together a team and produced it sort of in record time. You know, we worked very fast, developed it as fast as we could and and gave Cheryl the support we could to get it to where it was. And then we had extraordinary public discussions after every single performance. And it was wild because sometimes you go to a theater piece and they have these public discussions. and You can't wait to leave. No one wanted to leave. Mm. They just wanted a place to talk. And we realized, oh, there's no place to talk. Mm. It's not going to happen in schools. It may or may not happen in your religious institution. It may, there's no village square. Like my wife's from Italy and you're like, and you know, at the evening you go to the Piazza del Duomo and everyone's talking about the news mm. and you could just strike. We don't have that anywhere. I don't, you know, it may happen online, but again, it's a different level of satisfaction, yeah. you know? Yeah, totally. So, so what I'm hearing from you is, is, a a great acknowledgement and appreciation for for so many things your your cast and your crew and those that you're working with but also for the time period for right. current events um and then also for your audience um so i i think that all of that you know can culminate into 
of course, someone as great as you who's award winning. Oh. Um, but I guess what other is there any other advice that you might give to stage artists looking to become directors or what what skills does someone need to cultivate in order to become an artistic director? Um, I guess I would say make the work you want to make. Life is short. You know, make the work that matters most to you. Um, because whatever you make is hard. And if you're making something you don't believe in, it's as hard and difficult and you'll stay up as late and worry as much and struggle as much as if as when you're making something that you're deeply passionate about. Mm. So make the work you want to make. Make it now. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait till everything's perfect. Don't wait till there's gobs of money or an incredible institution. You know, if you have to sort of hustle and put it together, you know, do that. Um, know that every single person that you're going to encounter is essential in, in a theater, is essential to making the work. You know, I mean, the overused phrase, it takes a village is absolutely true. If you don't treat with respect your stage crew who are sweeping that stage to make sure there's no nails in it, you know, that if they don't care, our, our staff cares deeply, but if they don't care because they're treated shoddily and, the, uh, and a screw is left on that stage and an actor steps on it, that show's over, you know, mm -hmm. you stop. Or, you know, how do you make everyone part of the journey? You know, how do you imbue uh, not only the theater, your cast, your crew, your creative team with the, the reason to do the play. Why is it essential? Why are we doing the work we're doing now? And make sure that, you know, that you live your mission. You know, what what drives you? Because um, it's not easy. You never have enough money. You never have enough time. Even when you're a big organization like ourselves, there's never enough money. There's never enough time. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and then surround yourself with people that inspire you, challenge you, and are infinitely smarter than you are, mm -hmm. you know, because then you're going to learn from them yeah. endlessly. Yeah. I mean, the things, I guess, what I try and do is, and I, you know, I do this sometimes okay and sometimes not so okay, which is try and run the theater in a way like a rehearsal room, which is that, you know, you prepare, you do your work, but when I'm in a rehearsal room, you know, I'll prepare for months and months and months for the show, but I'm also... Uh, uh, obsessed by being completely open to what happens in the room, mm. because I'm I'm guaranteed, guaranteed. No matter how much I prep, there's a better idea in the room than what I came up with mm. on my own, and so, and so I try and make sure that I'm open to that. Same way in an institution, you know, you go into a staff meeting about X or Y or this collaboration or that collaboration or this project or that project. There's definitely a better idea than yours, mm -hmm. you know, and so just making sure that you've made space for that that people feel safe and comfortable expressing that idea because if you don't make that space, the work won't be extraordinary because, you know, I mean, maybe you're a genius. I don't consider myself a genius by any stretch of the imagination, but I am someone who can hopefully cultivate and curate ideas and then hopefully try and move it forward. Yeah. So um, um, make work all the time if you want to be an artistic director and, and every, and, Learn as much as you can about everything because everything you touch uh, can inform you. And whether that's how to deal with people, how to how to understand history, how to understand your community, how to build alliances in your community, how to listen with respect, how to shut up, you know, mm -hmm. and stop talking sometimes mm. because um, um, there's great wisdom out there that if you're the one who's talking all the time, you're not going to hear, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. So... Um, um, you know, and don't be afraid to make decisions and don't be afraid to listen hard and be humble, mm, you know? Yeah. And so you have to do both. And that in a day, I guess the, the radical part of these jobs is in a day, is in the same day. You can talk to someone, an artist who doesn't have health care and is not sure where they're going to make rent and then have drinks or a dinner with a person worth $500 million mm -hmm. who's a friend of the theater to, in my case, the parent, a conversation with the parent of a child who is struggling to working with a student actor to working, you, you know, with adult professionals who are new in their career or have won Tony Awards. Mm -hmm. 
<coughs> so the varieties of individuals <coughs> that you'll be talking to and working with are radically different mm. and you have to provide space and respect for every single one of them yeah and so if you can't do that <laughs> it's a hard job you know yeah totally. and if you can do that you'll learn a lot and you'll be inspired a lot and you'll be given great gifts. Mm, mm, that's beautiful. So, so you were previously you had mentioned this before. You were previously the artistic director of the Honolulu Theater for Youth, yeah. And now you're the soon-to-be former artistic director of the CTC. You put so many years of careful work into these organizations, receiving various accolades. It must not have been an easy decision to make for you. Um, what inspired you to move on from these positions, and what's next for you? Well, I moved on from Hawaii, uh, which I loved being there. It was so interesting, so complicated, such a gift to be there. And, um, you know, um, also as a as a white man to be a minority in, you know, an Asian Pacific land was instructive and powerful and important. Um, and also just to get access to that incredibly rich culture was such a gift. I came here because of the opportunity to try and make and change the flagship theater mm. for young people in, in North America. Um, and I think I made the decision because I love making work. I love being in the room with actors. I love working with playwrights and helping them find their, vi you know, articulate and fulfill their vision. Um, and yet there are aspects of this that I've done a lot mm. and they're, you know, and so, um, and, you know, and so some of those aspects are generally on the admin side, you know, um, I felt like I've done this. I'm not sure I want to keep doing this. Mm. You know, I love making work and I love interacting with the audiences and interacting with actors. But there was a part of me that I just didn't want to go out when I was uh, um, tired or bitter or sad or frustrated. I wanted to go out loving the work and loving the institution. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think about it every day. If I gone too soon, I'm excited. I've got so many projects here in development, but the decision was made. New leadership is coming in and um, and I'll be moving on with my life. Yeah, so, so what's next for you? I don't know, you know, I'm interested. I mean, there are things about um, other creative forms that fascinate me. Theater is both uh, gorgeously collaborative wonderfully collaborative, you know, a whole room full of bright people coming up with ideas, but it's also a giant machine. You know, it takes a lot of work, you know, mm -hmm. from making sure every prop costume, you know, marketing pro brochure. And I'm married to a fiction writer, formerly a playwright and watching that courage of that individual voice. And so we go to a lot of, uh, not as many as I'd like, but we go to a fair number of readings, you know, fiction ratings. And I just love that how personal that is and so i'm interested in in uh becoming a beginner again and writing mm. and so that interests me because you know i've been in a position of leadership for a while and the idea of not having that and being sort of a rank beginner with no training <laughs> makes me laugh and makes me a little bit happy no, and yeah. terrified so i like that so I'm, I'm interested in trying to do some fiction writing it's really hard and i i've never studied it I, i'm a theater person and so i'm interested in that and and also finding ways of being of service to the field. You know, I, I do get calls periodically sort of to, for people asking for advice on various issues of being an artistic director or being a, a leader. And, you know, if that can be useful, I'm happy to do that. Um, um, and then I'm trying to figure out ways to be of service. You know, I've, I've tried to live a, a, a life of of activism and and so trying to figure out what's the way that's going to be that I can be useful and that I can make a make a contribution. Mm. So I don't know the answer yet. I'm I I plan to do some of that thinking this year, but I'm so busy. I'm directing three shows and working, you know, and directing the fundraiser and taking a group to to, to New York of donors and and developing 12 projects. Mm. So it's incredibly busy. Yeah. And some of those projects are with very uh, um, newer writers and some of those are with hugely experienced writers and some of those are you know uh, with commercial producers very large projects and some of those are very intimate projects and so they're all really 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 different right okay so, so it's a so it's it's a gift of 
of busyness and a, a challenge of this time, but I will hit June 30th and um, I'm sure there'll be a, a huge surprises as I navigate the next chapter. But you know, it'll be fine. It'll be great. Wow. So I I know we don't have very much time, so I just have one last question for you. In your last production with the CTC, um, what made you decide on Alice in Wonderland and what is maybe unique about your telling of this classic story? Um, so um, what I what I love about this piece it's a piece about curiosity, courage, resilience, openness. It's a piece about entering unknown worlds and 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 trying to make sense of it and not rejecting it and trying to join it, which I think is a good metaphor for the world we're in now. Mm. I mean, you know, driving to work, hearing about AI mm -hmm. and the you know what, you know, the world that we'll be in where, you know, it's it's going to be both an ethical, political, economic, criminal conundrum of stuff. And and you can't stop it. You can't put it back in the box. It's here. And so, so you know, Alice is like she's landed in, in one world after another. And so encouraging that curiosity and making sure that the, the actress playing Alice, we have two that alternate, just making sure that it's with that spirit of courage and curiosity that we greet the world. Part of what's also a joy for me is also honors a particular designer that we had the pleasure of working with who who illness took uh, from us far too early, Skip Mercier, who made just a beautiful design. It's stunning and poetic and wild and bold and ridiculously imaginative, you know, filled with, you know, miniatures and and um, sort of circus tricks and all, all kinds of things. And so, um, uh, so, and the other thing we did is I had this idea that because the world is so odd that at odd and uh, unusual places, people should burst into song for maybe five seconds or 10 seconds. So the first time I did it, I. I just like come up with a song and sing it in my phone and hand it, hand it off to my composer. But the song would literally be like, great to see you. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the song and not chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, any of that. And it was just like song out, gone. And so in our first production, we had about 68 of them. We've added about 10. I have a goal of trying to hit 80 for whatever reason. So that there are these things where it's just like burst into song and it's over. And it just, you know, like it doesn't take two or three minutes to build and circle back and all that yeah. stuff. It's just like in and out. And so it's got this weird kind of musicality to it that just leaps and surprises you. And so and we have a live one person playing about 14 instruments who foley's the whole show. Wow. And so so we're doing that. And so um, uh, and we're invoking all kinds of uh, 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 uh you know, sort of musical styles, you know, hmm. you know, echoing Tom, you know, like this, uh, like a Tom Waits style thing and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, scat singing and all, just all kinds of manners that are just radically different. Um, wow. So so that's part of this production as well. And then a huge amount of audience interaction. You know, we're we do, we're just adding new audience interaction moments almost every rehearsal. Like we're going into the audience, we're getting them out of their seats, we're having them sing along, we're having them do things. Um, uh, and we're not done. So so part of that is like, how do you make, I like theater that's alive that you can't see on the screen, mm. you know, that's not like film or television. Yeah. And so what makes it bloody unique? What makes it bloody alive? What makes it uh, an experience that you can't believe you just had. Yeah, yeah. And it sounds like anybody who wants to be able to really fully experience it, they should go ahead and get a ticket and yes. see the show. <laughs> well, thank it's, you. It's going to be some fun. Yeah. Be fun. Yeah. So thank you so much for being here today with sure. me, Peter, and sharing your insights into your life and your artistry. Um, Alice in Wonderland is on stage from February 13th to March 31st. For more information, including ticket sales, Go ahead and check out the Children's Theatre website at childrenstheatre.org, spelled the European way, so T-H-E-A-T-R-E, -E. that's childrenstheatre.org. This has been Zoomed In with Alexis, co-produced by Amherst Media. See you next time, and thank you. Thanks so much.